Well, uh, hello everyone. I'm glad uh, we got a, a good turnout today. We got a very special event. Uh, a well-known speaker, Dr. Dr. Tom Woods, prolific writer, bestseller, uh, 11 textbooks, or uh, not textbooks, but uh, regular regular books. Sponsored a series on EWTN for the Catholics in the room, uh, for the, the free market guys in the room, Peter Schiff, uh, other guys. Very prolific writer. Uh, turns out multiple multiple pieces of material a day, blog posts. This morning he launched an entirely new freedom uh, freedom based homeschool curriculum. So very very busy guy, very impressive. And today the the topic is going to be on not a, a free market emphasis or a Catholic emphasis like you'd expect from the, the Catholic Student Association, but a, a mixture of the two. So he wrote a book on this called the the Church in the Market, on how free market principles don't conflict with social justice. So today we'll, we've got an, an, an hour discussion of that and then directly following we'll have uh, refreshments over here on the side and uh, we plan like a, a mingling about where uh, Dr. Woods will walk about and, and answer the, the many questions I, I envision you'll have uh, for that. The, uh, I'd like to share one, one single anecdote before he, he comes up on the stage. Uh, we went out to dinner last night and uh, I presume that I would you know, be learning something from him, something probably on the lines of, of ec economics or, or history, since you know, he's, that's where his degrees are on and he does most of his writing in. But the thing that struck me the most was uh, uh, when we said grace before the meal that we were all Catholics sitting at the table. And uh, afterwards he stops and he says, guys, do you, uh, do you know how to say the grace in Latin? And uh, I, you know, I, I know my faith pretty well. The, the students here can attest. Usually they come to me for questions you know, like, the, hey, Peter, what's, what's the answer to this? I had no idea. So not only in economics history, but an expert in, in, in Catholicism as, as well, especially the, the, the market aspects. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, present Tom Woods on behalf of the Catholic Student Association and uh, sponsored by these guys behind us. Well, let's see. Let's get this a little closer. Now, is this for amplification? Yes, it is. All right. How's that? Is that better? Yeah. All right. Let's see if I can get it to come like right over where I'm. T All right. I have kind of a booming voice anyway. I used to be in. I used to do drama when I was younger. So that's. A, I didn't know he, Peter was going to tell that story. Yeah, that's true. But that's just show off, right? That's just show offy. I can do the grace in Latin, but. <laughs> I, I know a lot of weird things like that that are just, you know, once something gets into this uh, noodle up here, it just, it stays there. I got started uh, thinking about this general topic about t 10 or so years ago because I was getting more and more interested in the so-called Austrian School of Free Market Economics and I would write a lot about it and I was giving conference papers about it. And then I would get Catholic critics coming up to me and saying, well, you're a Catholic, right? Aren't you supposed to believe in the you know, living wage? Or aren't you, supposed to believe, aren't you supposed to hate capitalism? I just got so sick and tired of answering this that I thought I'm going to write a book about it so that the next time somebody asks me this, I just say, read my book. And I was inspired by that by one of my professors in college who wrote a book on the Monroe Doctrine. And he said he wrote this book on the Monroe Doctrine so that he would never have to talk about the Monroe Doctrine ever again. So this, this hasn't entirely worked. I do occasionally give public presentations like this one on this general subject. And it doesn't really seem to satisfy people to say, look, it's, look, it's only like 250 pages. Come on, go ahead and read it. But it made me feel good to sit down and write this. Because really what this is, this is what it looks like here. It's got, actually I'm not entirely sure what's on the cover to be honest with you 10 years later, but, <laughs> but the point of it is that um, it is, it's not just, a, I've had a lot of people who are not Catholic or not even religious who have read it and, and like it because it's like an introduction to economics. I mean it covers all the different sorts of topics you'd want to know, a lot of controversial topics. A lot of the sorts of criticisms that you would get as a free market person are in there and answered. But I did this as a way of showing that, well, in fact, uh, one does not have to feel committed to a particular school of thought just because uh, he ha happens to be a Catholic. There's a whole lot of options that are available to you. Now, I realize that this is sort of a mixed audience here, so we're not necessarily all Catholics or not even interested in this particular topic, but the sponsoring, the primary sponsoring organization is the Catholic Students Association. I, I am going to address this, but I think there will be enough general information that would be of interest to a, a general audience. And while I'm at it, I would like to say a word of thanks to the Catholic Students Association, to the Leadership Institute, and to this wonderful brand new free market institute over at Texas Tech. So you guys 
here in Lubbock are going to be getting a whole bunch of speakers over the, over the coming months and years uh, whom you are going to love thanks to the great, uh, I don't know where he went, uh, ben Powell, right here. I'm looking right at him, yeah. He's the director of the Institute. <laughs> Am I, do you not want me to spill the bit? Can I tell them who's coming in the fall? Anything you'd like, Tom. All right. So that, <laughs> That's right. All right. That guy's a jerk. <laughs> now, the Ben and the Free Market Institute are bringing Walter Williams to Lubbock in the fall. So you've got to get on their list, okay? You've got to come see Walter Williams. And if you don't know who Walter Williams is, go home and Google him. Not now. Wait. Okay. All right. So first we have to define some terms because it's, it's, it's tricky to talk about capitalism and the free market because people have... I think the wrong idea about what this is. Uh, people think that capitalism is somehow associated with and exemplified and personified by the guy on the monopoly box. You know, he's a short little guy with a white mustache, you know, carrying around sacks of money with dollar signs on him. Like, that's capitalism in a nutshell. Ben actually wrote a fantastic article, by the way, about why the game Monopoly is really not fair <laughs> as a, as a discussion of how the free market works because in the free market you don't actually randomly land on places and then you have no choice but to shell out some dough. Like it doesn't actually work that way. But people have these sort of boogeyman ideas of what capitalism is. We're all sort of propagandized into this from the time we're little kids into thinking that capitalism is about greed and grasping wickedness and so it's very hard to crack through that. And secondly, I think people are sometimes very slippery in the way they define this term. So I'll read books and they'll say, Alexander Hamilton was a supporter of capitalism because he believed in a high protective tariff and a, a privileged national bank and subsidies to business. Well, all three of those things are anti-capitalist. So I don't know what the... It, it's like historians seem to think that a national bank involves money and capitalism involves money, so maybe a national bank is capitalistic or, like, I don't know, or, or protective tariffs involve commerce and commerce has to do with capitalism. This is a logical fallacy called the fallacy of the undistributed middle term, for, for those of you who are interested in, in the study of logic, and it happens all the time. You know, it's like saying, uh, 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 well, I, I, I could give you a lot of logical fallacies, no point to get, get, get sidetracked. But the point is that when we try to approach this subject, we are faced with a lot of faulty presuppositions that a great many people have. So we have to cut through them. The free market and capitalism to me are just synonyms. And they simply refer to a system, in fact I, I hesitate even to call it a system. They refer to a situation in which human beings are free to make exchanges with each other without a third party coercing them. That's really all it is. It just means that you, we can enter into contracts with each other, we can buy and sell things, all bounded by private property rights. That's, that's all it is. It's not, there's nothing else. Doesn't mean, it's not a system that says that the rich get richer and the poor get... No, no. It's just a system of freedom of exchange. That's what it is. So in the world today we don't have systems that correspond to this ideal. We have systems that m that are compromised to one degree or another. And we have systems that more closely approach this ideal, but that's what the free market is. And this is why it's important, it's important to have this sort of definition because when you have the type of economic performance that we've had over the past five, six years, people will blame that on capitalism. They'll say, well, that's just the way capitalism is. It goes up and down, up and down, just like Karl Marx said. It just naturally tends toward a cyclical pattern. Well, it's important to, under, to make sure that what you're actually criticizing is capitalism. Because one of the points I made in my book, Meltdown, see, Ben, I'm promoting a second book now. One of the points I made in there is that the precipitating factor in the downturn that we've, we're still living through was not capitalism, per se, for heaven's sake, uh, was, was not deregulation. We, the banking industry is the most heavily regulated industry in the entire United States. There are 115 state and, and uh, federal institutions aimed at regulating the financial sector. If we had had 116, it wouldn't have changed anything. The precipitating factor was the involvement of the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve System pushed interest rates artificially low, and then for many years, from Greenspan up through Bernanke, the policy was to encourage what was called 
uh, the wealth effect, that the Fed will help to push stock prices up for this reason. It makes the wealthy feel wealthier, makes them feel more confident because look at their stock portfolios going up. And that confidence will lead them to spend and borrow more and this will stimulate economic activity. Well, that's nothing free market about that. That's just manipulation. That's just ginning up the markets. And so every time it looked like the market might come down a little, you had to goose the economy with more artificially created money. Or you had to goose the economy with bailouts because without the bailouts we would have had stock prices fall and we can't have that because that would undermine this wealth effect. This is all planning of the economy. That's not the free market. So this is what I mean, that we have to go into this with an understanding of what we're talking about. If you're talking about a system that people think is responsible for the conditions we're living through today, well yeah, they're going to be a little bit hostile and skeptical uh, when you begin. Now what has the church had to say on this subject? Well, a great many things over roughly a 120 year period in particular. We date the beginning of Catholic social teaching typically with an encyclical called Rerum Novarum from 1891 by Pope Leo XIII. Now papal encyclicals all have Latin names and when you translate the Latin they oftentimes don't seem to mean anything. So Rerum Novarum actually means of some new things. And you hear that, you think that's got to be like the worst title for uh, an article I've ever heard. Like why would you name it that? But the way they get their names from the first couple words of the encyclical. And then of, of course Latin has a, an oddball word order. So sometimes you get these weirdo combinations of words. But all the same, we, we date it back to that. But I think perhaps we ought to date it back to Quad Apostolici Muneris, Muneris from 1878 because that's an encyclical that was dedicated entirely to socialism and explaining why socialism was absolutely prohibited as an option for, for Catholics. And then Pope Pius XI in Quadrigesimo Anno in 1931 said that it is impossible for one to be a Catholic and a socialist. Just, just straight out, just like that. Now it's true on the other hand that we can find uh, papal statements that are critical of a free market economy. But these criticisms are of what the popes or bishops consider to be abuses of the market system rather than criticisms of private property itself. So there's a distinction between the criticisms that are made of socialism and of capitalism. Socialism is absolutely ruled out as a system. Whereas capitalism we hear some criticisms about the way it sometimes works out. Well that's quite different. And then we'll look more closely at what some of these criticisms might be and see if they correspond to the data that we've observed. Now again, the free market rests on the more or less inoffensive principle of the freedom of exchange of goods between peaceful individuals. That, that is its ultimate foundation. And Pope Leo XIII referred to private property, which is the basis of the free market, as, quote, sacred and inviolable sacred and inviolable. Now that phrase, that just those three words have yielded a huge scholarly journal literature for the past hundred years and people have tried to run away from that phrase as, as sort of more left liberal Catholics have written articles saying well no he couldn't possibly have meant that. By sacred and inviolable he must have meant profane and violable. Like they, they have to do whatever they can to get away from that phrase but there it is sacred and inviolable. So what I want to do is, again, look at, look at what the free market stands for, look at what the popes have said, and see if we can make sense of all this. And the typical way that this has been done is that you'll get a lot of people who are Catholics and who are for the free market, and I don't want to mention any names, but what they'll do is they will quote like three sentences from a papal statement that is favorable to the free market. Then they'll say, hey look, the popes support the free market, and then they run away. But well, what about the other three sentences later on in that document that seem to run counter to that? Are you just going to ignore those sentences? That doesn't seem honest. Right? And of course their opponents have pounced on this and said, well yeah, okay, you quote three sentences. What about the other three sentences? You know, it's, 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 and again, it's more like, hey, look over there and they just run away. I don't think that's an intellectually honest way to deal with this situation. So that's not the tack that I've taken in this book. I took a much, much more hardcore tack on this. My view is that we have to be honest, we have to face the entirety of the Catholic social teaching honestly, head on. And so, th so that's what I'm doing. And the, and the way I've handled it is as follows. That we have to make certain fundamental distinctions when we're talking about the authority 
that exists within the church and that resides in, in, uh, on many issues in the Pope himself. And so, for example, the Pope could very well say, um, if we are going to build churches, they need to be adequate to and appropriate for a solemn liturgical setting. And so they need to be built out of, for example, to, to be testaments to the eternal nature of God. They need to be of, they need to have a firm foundation. They need to be made of building materials that are especially solid and will stand the test of time as our, as our imperfect representation of God's standing the test of time. Uh, we want to have the sanctuary designed in a particular way. We want the altar to look a particular way. The Pope is perfectly within his rights to say these things, and popes have said these things. Uh, Pius XII had an encyclical on this, a Mediator Day in 1950, in dealing with the question of the, of the liturgy. But notice what the popes don't say. They don't say, now let me tell the architects exactly what would be the best way to build the church so that it stays up the longest. First you should use these materials, then you should use this building method. Of course, no pope would dream of saying that because none of them are experts in that field. What they'll say is these are the basic principles that should guide what the architect does with his specialized knowledge. But we don't possess that specialized knowledge, so we don't make pronouncements about that. Well, likewise, I'm arguing that the, the situation with economics is entirely analogous. So it's, it's perfectly fine for anybody in the church or outside the church to say it's generally a good thing for people with an abundance of goods to be generous with those goods. Uh, for example, if you had an abundance of goods, you might donate them to the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech, for example. It, it, that would be a moral principle that people are perfectly at liberty to, to put forth, and it makes perfect sense. You could also say the family is the building block of society, so therefore we want to have a, situ a, a system in which the well-being of families is maximized. Great, that's an, that's an excellent principle, nothing wrong with that. The problem comes when we then follow that up with, now, here are the best policies to bring that about. First, let's raise the minimum wage to 50 bucks an hour. Now, there's no pope who was ever foolish enough to recommend something like that. But the point is, you can see the difference between the two things. Saying, let's make families as prosperous as we can make them, fine. And then, here's how to do it. Now, now that's, where, that's where this would just be rank superstition. Because this is not a specialized area that the pope or any other church official has any particular insight into. And so it's, n but, but sometimes when we read some of these statements, we have to disentangle the general principle that's being put forth from the policy recommendation. Because what if, what if some policy recommendation were put forth, for example, a $50 an hour minimum wage, in the name of helping families. We're going to help heads of households by giving them this more than adequate wage. But what if the policy being recommended does not fulfill the requirement that the church official expects it to. So the point of the $50 minimum wage is to make heads of households better off. But what if it doesn't? Well, there is no answer because this question is never raised in, in circ scholarly circles that deal with Catholic social teaching. It's simply assumed that the policies that are recommended will have the desired effect. But what if they won't? Am I absolutely obligated as a Catholic to go along with a policy that I know is going to make people worse off than they are now? Could that, could that possibly be, be the case? It would be just as absurd if, if the, the Pope said, well, I think the best way to, to build a church would be out of whipped cream. Now, no, I mean, no one would say that, but I wouldn't be bound by that. I'd say, well, this is an area where he's talking about something that he's not, give, he's not vouchsafed any particular insight into. And again, I'm not trying to make light of this or be disrespectful, but this to me seems to be a rather an elementary distinction. And it was a distinction that was drawn not too long ago by the Archbishop of Newark. Because when, when we're looking for wisdom, we often think New Jersey. <laughs> and Archbishop Myers said this. He says, our prefer well, he uses the term preferential option for the poor. Let me explain what that is. The preferential option for the poor is a, is a term that's used in Catholic social teaching that basically means the following, that we should implement policies with an eye to increasing and improving the well-being of the poorest. We should make sure we, we're particularly keen on that. 
So he says, our preferential option for the poor is a fundamental aspect of this teaching. But there are legitimate disagreements about the best way or ways truly to help the poor in our society. No Catholic can legitimately say, I do not care about the poor. If he or she did so, this person would not be objectively in communion with Christ and his church. But both those who propose welfare increases and those who propose tax cuts to stimulate the economy may in all sincerity believe that their way is the best method really to help the poor. This is a matter of prudential judgment made by those entrusted with the care of the common good. It is a matter of conscience in the proper sense. Okay, well that's, that's my point. I am not saying that uh, everybody in the church has to read Ludwig von Mises like I do or, or, or enjoy the economic writings of Murray Rothbard as I do, but just simply that we can have legitimate differences of, of, of opinion on them. Okay, now I want to give an example of what I'm talking about here of a case where we have church authority saying something that I think gives difficulty to some, some layman. And the example I want to start off with is uh, the issue of foreign aid. In 1967, Pope Paul VI issued an encyclical called Populorum Progressio on the progress of peoples. And in that encyclical, he adopted what was a fairly conventional view in secular circles in the 1960s. There was nothing obviously Catholic about this document. Uh, it was a document that could just as easily have been written by a great many secular economists. And what the Pope was saying was there is a lot of deprivation all over the world. And it seems that the way to handle this is to support state-led development aid programs, that is to say government to government aid programs. So the, the Western world should shell out some dough and hand it to these, the governments of these developing countries. And that would be discharging one's obligation toward those in need. Now that seems, there's a certain plausibility to that, right? You've got rich people, you've got poor people, you just take some money from the rich people, give it to the poor people and that solves the problem. That, that does seem superficially plausible. Here, here's the difficulty with it. It was an absolute catastrophe on all levels in terms of the outcomes of this, this policy. Basically every country that was a recipient of one of these developing aid, uh, development aid programs either stagnated or retrogressed. They actually got worse because of these programs. Now it's true that the economics profession was all in favor of this stuff. Everybody, everybody, the New York Times, all the newspapers, the media, the politicians, all of them held this view, which to me is a, should, should have been a red flag to the Pope. Like wh wh when are these people ever right about anything, right? Like maybe we should go back and rethink this. There was one economist who distinguished himself in particular in the 50s, 60s, 70s named Peter Bauer and he taught at Cambridge and London. And he said, these programs are going to be a catastrophe. They're going to do exactly the opposite of, uh, of what they're intended to do. No one listened to him or, or they laughed at him. Remind you of somebody? Then he was totally vindicated. Remind you of somebody? He was vindicated in the 1980s when all the newspapers like the New York Times, and all these others, they were all saying, wow, it turns out that foreign aid has actually made things worse. Well, who would have guessed? I guess no one could have predicted that. Again, remind you of something? No one could have predicted this financial crisis. <laughs> you know, it's the same sort of thing. Well, you know, meanwhile, there's Peter Bauer in the back of the room saying, uh, hello, I wrote like half a dozen books on this exact thing, telling you people, you know, if you just shut up and listen to me, this wouldn't have happened. And so he was, he was giving warnings, and, I, and I'll explain for in a minute what exactly it was that Bauer said about these programs and, and how he was able to figure out that they weren't going to work. But there's one further point I want to make about Paul VI and that is in Popular and Progressio, Paul VI said that uh, one of the reasons that the solution is not to liberalize trade, the reason that the solution is not to liberalize trade with the developing world was that he, he bought into something that was called the Prebish Singer thesis that was prevalent in the, in the, in the 50s and 60s that basically said that there was, a, there was secular stagnation in the terms of trade. This was a general phenomenon. What that means is that according to this thesis, commodity prices tended to move downward and the prices of manufactured goods tended to move upward. And since developing countries tend to produce commodities, with their prices going down and the prices of manufactured goods from other countries going up, trade is just going to hurt them. So we, this is not a good thing for them. This hurts them. Well, it turns out that 
the, the Prebisch Singer thesis was refuted by the evidence. Uh, Gottfried Haberler had pointed this out years earlier. There is no, the Prebisch uh, Singer thesis is wrong. There is no secular deterioration in the terms of trade. This, this phenomenon does not actually exist. So now we have the problem of an encyclical that actually contains an outright factual error. Th that phenomenon can be shown by looking at the data to be non-existent. That the opposite was true. So again, it now becomes extremely urgent to make clear that we understand the distinction between laying out general moral principles and then recommending particular paths to follow to, to pursue them, to implement them. Now why did the foreign aid programs have so many problems? Well there are a great many reasons for it. For one thing, Bauer said they were, first of all, they're absolutely unnecessary. And he said, now if they were necessary, because the argument for why they were necessary was, these countries that are developing, they're really, really poor. What they really need is investment. Because if they could, if they could invest, they could buy equipment that would help to produce more goods. And now they'd have more goods, they'd be richer, and they could invest more in machinery that would produce even more goods. Now they'd be even richer, and this is the path you need to get going. But the problem is they're so poor, they can't make that initial investment. So they're stuck in this circle of poverty. They, they don't have enough to make the investment, so they continue to be poor. And that means they, they can't make investment next time around. And they continue to be poor, and they're just stuck. And Bauer said the problem with this thesis, one of the, just one of the problems is, if that were true, we would all still be in the Stone Age. There would be no wealthy countries because that would be true of everybody. How did the first, if foreign aid is how you break out of that circle of poverty, here's the money, now you can do your investment, where did the first rich country get its investment capital? From Martians? Like, where, how did it happen? So that can't be right. There's, right away there's something wrong with the logic of the programs. He argued that the foreign aid delays necessary reforms. Why reform your economy and your economic policies when you're getting free money? The worse your economy is, the more free money you get. Well, why would you bother changing? He found that the aid entrenches the worst regimes in power. Because the money is not going to hungry people. You know, th this much should be obvious by now. The money goes to the government, which then figures out what it wants to do with it buy off certain constituencies, sometimes subsidize the middle class, but the poor meant nothing to them. The poor have no clout. Why should I give this money to them? So it, entra it made the worst regimes stay in power even longer, because now they're getting all this extra dough to prop themselves up with. It also gave perverse incentives. The, the, the aid was a bad in itself, because now there was less incentive to think about ways to satisfy your fellow man and earn profits that way, and more of an incentive to think of ways to get hold of the grant money. Well, this is not suitable if you want to have a sound economy that's geared towards satisfying consumer wants. Uh, but there are many more reasons as well, and we can also see practical examples. When, when Hong Kong had its aid cut off, it absolutely flourished. It realized, well, now we, we can't be silly anymore. We've got to really adopt a market economy and we'll just open ourselves up to uh, liberal trade. And in fact, if it were true that, that trade was a bad route for these countries to take, then th the most isolated tribal societies in the world should be the wealthiest because they weren't being exploited by the West. And yet, that was exactly the opposite. The more they opened themselves up to trade, the more prosperous uh, these countries became. All successful economies in the world have, at least to some degree, stable property rights and a legal system that is, in one way or another, favorable to, toward commerce and, and free exchange. And that advice is the best thing that the Western world has to give. Certainly not billions of dollars to some rotten cannibal who's, who, you know, who actually, I mean, th there actually were, uh, at, uh, for a time in, in Africa, there actually were political leaders who ate people. It actually did not help to give them money, as it turns out. <laughs> well, now, the, now uh, that was all gone for, a long, for about 20 years. People agreed, yeah, this just didn't work. And in fact, uh, Margaret Thatcher honored Peter Bauer and, gave, and named him Lord Peter Bauer. And then right toward the end of his life, he won the Milton Friedman Prize from the Cato Institute, which carries a $500,000 cash award. And then he died like just like that. So it's just like poor Peter Bauer, right? He's totally ignored, ignored, ignored. And then finally, this is day in the sunshine. And then, but he, he, did, he did his work. And yet, 
I wonder if he's rolling in his grave because now in the past 10 years, now they're calling it the new economics of foreign aid. Well, this time we'll try to give the money to people who don't eat other people and then maybe it'll work better. But as I've said, there are perverse incentives that are associated with the aid that, that make it on net a bad. There are things that voluntary organizations can do that are a heck of a lot better. And it turns out that in the United States, Americans voluntarily donate twice as much money to various overseas causes than the U.S. government gives to, in, in many cases, a counterproductive causes. And of course, they would do more if they didn't have all their money being taxed from them. All right, so that's, a, that's an example of what I mean. It obviously could not have been binding on somebody. Yes, I am bound by religious obligation to support a policy that is going to have these outcomes, the, these, these results. So that's why it's important to make proper distinctions. Now, the second point I want to make uh, involves Pope Leo XIII. Now, Leo XIII had an important anti-Marxist insight. Karl Marx had the view that labor and capital are necessary antagonists. Right? They have interests that are entirely contrary to one another. But Leo XIII rejected this. He said, no, 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 capital and labor are not, are not hostile forces facing each other. They're complementary. They, their interests together are harmonious. Now that is an important insight and I think the best way to show how that insight is instantiated on the free market and reflected on the free market is to use a thought experiment that I've used uh, a lot of times. I, I give this example. I, I, I say, let, let's, suppose, let's suppose one day we woke up and Martians had indeed landed and they had, they had left with all the productive equipment that we use, all our capital goods, all our assembly line equipment, all our transportation, uh, all our communication, all our cell phones, and all they left us with were the telegraph and, uh, I don't know, horses. Now obviously, we, I mean, pff, I haven't got the slightest idea how to use a telegraph, and I suppose I could ride a horse, but this would be pretty devastating to us. And, and think about why it would be devastating. How much could we produce under those conditions when basically everything would have to be produced with your bare hands? Could, could you produce a plasma TV from scratch with just your bare hands? Could you produce a refrigerator with just your bare hands? Now, I mean, I'm talking about things, for example, let's, let's imagine goods where there's a lot of steel that's necessary. Let's, uh, let's say we have to build an automobile. Could, could you do iron ore work, uh, mining iron ore with your bare hands? I mean, just think of all that would be required. Of course, there would be whole classes of goods you can't produce at all. And what goods you can produce, you can produce only in, well, minimal uh, quantities. I mean, I think about my own father's case. My father was a forklift operator for 15 years in a, in a food warehouse. And he used this forklift to lift these very heavy pallets of food and move them around the warehouse. How, imagine if he had to do that with his bare hands, how little work he could accomplish, and there would be qualitative things he couldn't even do. There's no way he could even move some of the pallets because they have to be packed up so high, there's no way he could get up there without that forklift. But in my scenario where the Martians have taken all the forklifts, that's the world we would be living in. So everybody would recognize intuitively that we would all have to work extra, extra hard just to earn enough purchasing power to eke out a bare subsistence living. We would all, I think, instinctively understand that if we said, well, pff, Martians or no Martians, I ain't working more than 40 hours a week. <laughs> well, okay, you could try that, but 40 hours a week with your crummy bare hands as compared to 40 hours a week with all these machines that we used to have is going to produce a tiny, tiny amount of production. And so the amount of production that each of us per capita is going to have to be satisfied with is going to be much, much lower. So what would be the way out of that? Supposing we, we can't chase after the Martians, the only way out of that is to save and pour that saving into investment in new machines to get back to the economy that was as productive as it was in 2013. That's the only way out. Uh, w would it make sense to say, well, let's see, there's a guy down the street and he's got twice as big a house as I have and he's got ten times as much furniture. Why don't we just redistribute his stuff to the hundred thousand people in this neighborhood? I mean, this would be preposterous. No one would even notice the difference in his standard of living if we took this one guy who, okay, maybe he eats twice as much food and he has ten times the furniture or something. 
Okay, so everybody would wind up with one-tenth of an extra table leg if we cut up all this guy's furniture and redistributed it. This would be worse than useless because that guy would probably run away. He would certainly not do anything next year knowing that we're just going to take his stuff from him. This would be the worst policy imaginable and yet that's what your textbook says should have been done during the Industrial Revolution. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, when they're just starting to mechanize production, people lived in the economy that I just described to you. Uh, people lived in what we would consider an I unbelievable nightmare. That was their lives. And the strong implication of your elementary and middle school textbook is, well, we didn't have wise government officials who would just redistribute wealth. What wealth? What are you talking about? There was no wealth that was of any substantial. Where were the plasma TVs in 1790? Of course, there weren't any. So it, it's, it turns out that the, the way you can do this, the way you can return to prosperity, is through not confiscating all the profits in the private sector, but allowing them to be plowed back into these businesses so we can get those assembly lines going, get this machinery going, and then we can have prosperity. And the prosperity comes about not because anybody is physically looted and then I get their stuff. It comes about because as more machinery is brought into production, the goods, the output that we get, all the food, all the electronic equipment, all the clothes, all the things that we want are now produced in such great abundance that it pushes their prices down. That we don't have to work as long to earn a pair of jeans. Like a hundred years ago you had to earn, you had to work like two or three times as many hours to earn the purchasing power to earn a pair of jeans as you do now. And that phenomenon exists for all consumer goods across the board, whether it's electricity, or, or a, a chicken, or all these sorts of goods that, that you and I use, you have to work far less today to get the purchasing power for them. Why is that? Because the economy can produce so much more of them. They're in so much greater abundance. We're not all, it's not like there's one chicken for 10 people, so we bid up the price to $800. There's like 18 chickens. For, you know, so I mean, you, you, the prices are much lower in terms of how much we have to work to get them. So this goes to show then that Leo XIII's insight is absolutely correct because now we see that it really is true that labor and capital have harmonious interests. What should they both want to see? They should both want to see an economy in which private firms are free to reinvest their profits in capital investment to improve the standard of living. They should not want to live in a society in which government confiscates this money in the name of some higher good. Because all this does is retard the process of getting us out of the nightmare economy and into a more comfortable one. So this is the, this is the response to when you're in school and you're being lectured about this and only an idiot, an evil person could support the free market because it, it gives you grinding poverty. No, no, no. The world gives you grinding poverty. Nature gives you grinding poverty. It's only this system that made it occur to people that it was possible to reverse this. Nobody protested against poverty in the year 1300. There are no recorded protests against poverty because it never occurred to anybody that that could be changed. It was just taken for granted that basically you are going to be born into disgusting squalor. You're going to live your life one bad harvest away from starvation and then you're going to drop dead. And you've got to make the best of that. And it never occurred to anybody that maybe Maybe we don't have to live like this. Maybe crawling around in the dirt is not the only way uh, to, to live. I mean, if you look at, in the 18th century, look at the way a French peasant lived. The material level, it's just appalling. And I might add, by the way, that some of the criticism that I would get when I would make arguments like this is that I'm being materialistic, that I'm suggesting that all that matters are consumer goods and all you care about is how many iPods you can buy and so on and so forth. And I'm, I'm not saying that. I mean, I do think having an iPod is better than not having an iPod. And it is, I mean, the iPod can be used for all kinds of wonderful purposes that can elevate the mind and the soul. It doesn't always serve that purpose, but there is the potential. Um, the Bible became a best-selling book under the, under the free, free market system. I mean, like, there are reasons that one, one ought to, to favor this, but I'm not saying that material goods are all that matters. But if you are better provided for materially, you are more able to have the leisure time to pursue an interest in uh, Renaissance painting 
or Gregorian chant or whatever. But somebody who can barely get enough food to survive is probably not going to be an aficionado of those things. So it's precisely because you can in fact elevate yourself more when your needs are met that, well, this is something to to bear in mind. And then secondly, remember that Catholic social teaching itself is advanced on the principle that we need these policies to improve the material condition of the poor. So what are we now going to say that Catholic social teaching is materialistic? So the point is we, we all want to see this. We all want to see people not starve. We all want to see uh, infant mortality rates go down. Like who would be against that? In fact, Ludwig von Mises said, if you want to insult the, uh, if you want to cast the first stone at the so-called materialism of the economists, you know, then, then come around and tell me that you're not really interested in seeing infant mortality decline or diseases be, be conquered. I mean, because that's what we're talking about when we talk about improving our, our material standard of living. Now, it could be, though, that maybe this is just a whole lot of theoretical mumbo-jumbo and that in practice, you know, I can theorize about the free market, but in practice, the poor are just ground down by it, right? And, and that we have inequality in the world, and, and this is all the fault of the free market. Now, the inequality question is a whole uh, separate talk. Uh, there are benign reasons for inequality, and there are, uh, there are bad reasons for inequality, and some of them have to do with uh, government involvement. I think, I think there are, I, I think we, we just saw in the financial crisis that certain people have their interests taken care of. Uh, the, the, the CEO of GE can get on the phone. The, the CEO of uh, Bank of America can get on the phone. They, these institutions can call up and say, hey, I want you to ban short selling because that would give us some breathing room and done. Hey, I need a big bailout. I, I, I made dumb decisions and I, I don't want to have to face those. Done. Well, that's a bad kind of inequality. There was inequality in the Soviet Union. If you were part of the bureaucracy, you were well taken care of. So it's not that, well, if we have communism, then we'll have equality. No, 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 the people administering the communism then become the unequal ones. I, I'll just point out parentheses. I have a, a friend who used to live in the Soviet Union. He told me a few years ago that the real story of what daily life was like there has never really been told. He said, I, I'll just give you the most trivial example. He said, if your toilet backed up, you could not get a plumber to fix it. Now that seems like a small thing, but it's actually quite an indignity to have to deal with a backed up toilet for months on end. That's here, your toilet's backed up, you get a plumber, it's fixed, end of it. Or, or you go on YouTube and you find how to fix your toilet or some kind of thing, you do it. He said, but we, we didn't have that. He said, what we, because the central planners never provided enough plumbers. So if you wanted to get the plumber even to come through the door, you had to lay out for him the greatest feast that your family had ever prepared. And that would get him in the door and maybe three months from then he'd, he'd fix your toilet. So now multiply that by all the different aspects of life. And this is not even, not even counting the spiritual deprivations and all that. I, I mean, that, that's what that was like. So there was no getting rid of, of, of inequality uh, there. But Mises would say, would say this. Now, of course, Ludwig von Mises is one of the great Austrian school economists. And he made this point. He said, in the old days, we look at the difference between how people used to travel. Hundreds of years ago, the poor would travel on foot and with really bad shoes. Like, they, you know, people didn't have like an extra pair of shoes. They were lucky to have one beat up pair of shoes or sometimes they were walking with no shoes at all. Whereas the rich man, he was able to ride in a coach driven by four horses. Today, the rich man drives around in a really fancy car and the poor guy travels around in a really beat up car. But by that standard, that is a radical diminution of inequality because people are driving cars. We consider that in the 1950s, one of my favorite show, I was not born yet, but one of my favorite old shows is The Honeymooners. Now, if you look at Ralph Cramden's house, his, his apartment, I'll grant you Ralph Cramden was a cheapskate and every, that was part of the running joke on the show. He's a cheapskate and he won't buy anything for his wife. But it was not considered completely preposterous to have a show in which the main characters had no telephone, no television, certainly no dishwasher, no refrigerator. They had an ice box and some of you guys are young enough, you don't even know what that is. It was a thing where every day a guy brings a giant ice cube to their house and they put that in this ice box and that keeps their food cold. That was one lifetime ago that it was considered like plausible somebody could live that way. 
Now, without in any way minimizing the condition of people who are materially deprived, relatively speaking today, that's the type of progress that's been made just since then. Nobody lives like that now, basically. Right? I mean, e everybody has a cell phone, for example. A I mean, no one could have, people thought it was cool in the 1990s to have a car phone with a big, with a cord that went like one foot. You could kind of barely drive while talking on it, and you were like the king of the world. Whereas now we would laugh at you as some kind of a chump for this. And this has all occurred basically because of the process that I've described. And then also we've seen around the world liberalization of economies. And liberalization, I don't mean Hillary Clinton liberal. I mean liberal in the classical sense of, of removing restrictions on commerce and, and so on. Now it hasn't been as rapid or as widespread as we'd like. But if you look, for example, at India, where there's been a tremendous move toward freer markets, India's real GDP per head more than doubled between 1980 and 2000. And in China, of course, we've seen uh, dramatic uh, improvements, although, again, there are obvious problems there as well. But poverty has fallen dramatically around the world. This is the opposite of what people would think. If you ask the average person on the street, what do you think the trend in poverty has been around the world over the past uh, 50 years, 60 years? I'm pretty sure that person would say, oh, it's gotten much worse. I I'm virtually certain that's what I would get. The exact opposite is the case. In the past 50 years, we've seen more progress against poverty than we've seen the previous 500 years. That in 1820, we had 85% of the world living in what economists call absolute poverty. Poverty of a level that Americans can't remotely conceive of. 17 out of 20 people lived in that. Then you get down to 1950, and that was down to 50 percent. Then by 1980, early 1980s, it was down to 33 percent. And then with the new millennium, it was down to about 18 percent. So in the 20 year period from the early 80s to the early 2000s, both the percentage and the absolute number of poor people in the world fell. That has never happened at any other time in the history of the world. In the United States, the lowest quintile of the, so, that, so that is to say the lowest 20% of the income distribution in the United States saw their incomes increase by 10, 15, 18 fold during the 20th century. The vast bulk of this coming before the government got into the welfare business. Uh, poverty actually fell from what we, we would consider poverty today was about 95% when you got into uh, the year 1900. By the late 1960s, right around the time they were just getting started with the war on poverty programs, it was down to between 12 and 14 percent, and then it's stagnated there ever since. Government's been involved in it ever since, and it's stagnated. Now, suppose the opposite were the case. Suppose the government had been involved with welfare programs all through the 20th century, and then they stopped in the 60s. And so is the government spending money on anti-poverty stuff, and poverty comes down, you can imagine what people would say. Well, that goes to show, without the government, the free market's not going to solve the poverty problem. But the exact opposite occurred. When the government was extremely minimal in this area, that's when poverty was, was conquered. And so that's why we never hear this statistic. N nothing. Not a thing. In, in England, we've seen over, uh, since the 19th century, the difference between a rich person and a poor person in terms of height was over a foot and now it's two inches. And then caloric intake is also the difference between the developing world and the developed world has, has shrunk. And life expectancy, the difference has shrunk. All these things have occurred at the same time as liberalization has occurred. So the, the phenomenon that I was describing to you before, th therefore, is not just theoretical. We actually see it, we actually see it in the real world. All right, well, finally, I'll try and uh, bring things more or less to a close. I talked to my father being a forklift operator, so we'll do that. I think, it's, uh, I think it's obvious that what I said earlier about this term, the preferential option for the poor, that we should design our, uh, our policies with an eye to what's best for the, for the poorest, I think it should be clear by now that the market is the preferential option for the poor. Because when we look around the world, we look at these various economic freedom indexes that, that are compiled every year. One thing we find is that the poor suffer from the fewest deprivations in the most market-oriented societies. So even if you wanted to say, well, we've got to have the, we've got to make sure the government is pursuing the policy that is best for the poor, leads you to the same outcome, uh, uh, namely the free market. All right, um, I finally want to conclude with the issue of private property because that is what's at the heart of the free market. The free market involves private property owners exchanging property titles. That's all it is. 
That's it. For the boogeyman definitions to the contrary notwithstanding. That's all it is. And one of the things that you get told when you're somebody like me and you're advancing the idea that uh, Catholics are perfectly at liberty to support the free market for the reasons that I've mentioned uh, is, is that uh, private property is not absolute in the Catholic tradition. Well, that's not entirely correct. There are two traditions of thought in the church on the subject of private property. And it is true that the majority tradition does hold that private property is not absolute and it can be compromised for the sake of, of uh, building up the common good. But you have to be pretty, I'd say you have to be pretty precise on what that term means. But there is a, a minority tradition in the church that extends from the theologian Henry of Ghent uh, through Pope John the 22nd, not 23rd, a different person altogether, and all the way through Leo the 13th. We already saw he refers to private property as being sacred and inviolable. So there is this minority tradition. But the other point I would make about private property, uh, is it absolute or not, is this. St. Thomas Aquinas says, when he was asked, uh, in, or he posed the question to himself, should all vices be crimes? And he says, no, not all vices should be crimes. Well, then what vices should be crimes? And he goes and he says, well, by and large, vices that involve harm to others. Okay, well, that's kind of what I'm saying. And he says that's what, now, he's even willing to say that prostitution could be tolerated if suppressing it would lead to greater evil still. So, if St. Thomas Aquinas can say that about, because sort of his view was they don't call it the world's oldest profession for nothing. If you thought you think you can get, away, get it rid of it, you're, you're living in a dream world and we're not utopians. We are realistic as, as Catholics. So he says you can tolerate certain, uh, certain uh, sins like this if suppressing them would lead to worse evils. Well, what about private property then? Private property is not a sin. And what if I argue that suppressing it or compromising it can lead to worse evils than just allowing it? then surely if we can tolerate prostitution, it seems to me I could make an equally good case that we could tolerate absolute right to private property. Now again, that doesn't mean that therefore you should be a fetishist who rolls around in your money naked and, and, and like you, you get some kind of immediate direct satisfaction from the money in that way. Obviously that would be perverse. And you know, my wife and I, like to me half the fun is throwing money at people and things, right? I just, I love doing that. Well, th this or organization, this local theater needs another X dollars. Okay, great. Uh, we got this email uh, a year or so ago because Sam Brownback is the governor of Kansas. He was cutting out the Kansas arts organization, whatever it was. And we got this email from a theater saying, what are we going to do with this Neanderthal Sam Brownback? Because we used to get $5,000 in the state and now what are we going to do? And I thought, one bake sale, for heaven's sake, like a yard sale would bring, I mean, five, you can't think of how you would raise $5,000. Send out an email like this and you'll raise the $5,000. But it just, it goes to show what this sort of mentality, it leads to this kind of feeling of helplessness that, uh, well, I, we, we can't accomplish anything without basically looting our neighbor. And it leads to the encouragement of the basest human instincts. It, it, it encourages our grasping instincts that I want something, so therefore I should just try and bring about a situation where somebody grabs it for me. And I, I'm not convinced that is an aspect of human nature that we want to encourage, but that is encouraged by the idea that government is there to, if you have some interest that you want to pursue, it will clock your neighbor over the head, take his stuff and give it to you. I think that encourages bad aspects of human nature and does not encourage charity. To the contrary, we've actually seen that people are less generous as a percentage of GDP now as governments have grown and tax levels have grown than they were before. And, and that's, it's not even close, actually, because people feel like, well, I already, I already gave at the IRS. Why should I do anything? And so people lose the, and this is one of the points that Pope Benedict XVI made in uh, Caritas and Veritate. He says, it's not like we're just some, you know, uh, uh, state bureaucracy have, giving checks to people. You know, like, we're like a more important thing than that. And what we're about is, is, is we want to help the giver and the recipient. We want this to be a spiritual meeting of minds and souls. And, and that is completely snuffed out when you just throw everything on the state. No, the Catholic principle is that responsibilities are supposed to be as local as they can possibly be, starting with the, the household unit. And there are some things that households can't do for themselves, so households get together. Like, for example, homeschooling is a good example. 
Some households can do homeschooling entirely on their own. But others of them have decided that, well, it would be better if we combine with these other households, because you're an expert on chemistry and you're an expert on this. And then they, they do that next. They don't immediately say, we need education, then let's go to Washington, D.C. You don't do that. That is absolutely contrary to Catholic tradition. That is contrary to the principle of subsidiarity. And then lastly, uh, Pope John Paul II was very fond of saying that people should be treated as ends in themselves rather than as means to ends. Well, I, I happen to be of the opinion that the market economy is the only economic system that honors that principle because it's the only system in which a, uh, a transaction occurs only when both parties want that transaction. In any other system, there's got to be a, a guy with a gun and a badge who's coercing you into the transaction. A communist system, an interventionist system, the government comes to you and says, uh, uh, this farmer needs your money more than you do. We've the, the committee has decided, so we're going to take it. Well, that's using me as a means to an end. That's not using me as a, that's not treating me as an end in, in myself. And John Paul went on to say, the moral causes of prosperity reside in a constellation of virtues. Industriousness, competence, order, honesty, initiative, frugality, thrift, spirit of service, keeping one's word, daring, in short, love for work well done. No system or social structure can resolve as if by magic the problem of poverty outside of these virtues. Again, what system encourages these virtues? Uh, one in which people are encouraged to believe that uh, thou shalt not steal except by majority vote? Or in which one, uh, people are taught, well, in order to get by in this world, you have to think creatively of some way to serve your fellow man. That, to me, in a nutshell, is why I think I can say with confidence that there is no contradiction between Catholicism and the market order as I've described it to you today. Okay, thank you very much.